warning. The videos used in this movie are not of the best quality, despite having been restored. I apologize in advance if any audio used is hard to hear or is distorted in any way. With that, I hope you enjoy the film. Tampa. Throughout the 1980s and 1990s was a hot spot for local musicians to showcase their talent. After the sun went down, the town came to life. Neon signs illuminated the night sky, while jam and rock music filled the air. It was truly a great time to be alive. Back in those days, you had bands like Van Halen, Dio, Hart, even Tampa's own Outlaws. Too many to name, really. However, when we think of Tampa musicians, one name comes to mind. A local drummer by the name of Chris Kidd. So now, sit back, relax, and take a trip with me down memory lane. This is his story. Born in Tampa, Florida in the early 1960s, Chris is one out of four siblings born to Sam and Helen Kidd. Chris developed a love for music at an early age, going to church on Sundays together with his brother Mark and friend Patrick Foy who lived just around the corner. They would sing gospel songs like Amazing Grace and Rugged Cross under the name Patrick Foy and the Kidd Brothers. Growing up, uh, we had a wild uh, growing up with our uh, mom and dad, but but our mom, you know, we got into Pentecostal and, you know, Chris and me and Pat would always, you know, we were kind of like the little straight gang. Uh, and then we ended up doing music, you know, and uh, Pat harmonized very well with me. I did a good job with that part as far as that. Chris and I grew up in the same neighborhood, so we went to the same school and we became friends. At a really young age, we started playing music together when he was like seven, I was ten, so I'm, a, I'm about three years older than Chris. And uh, we just hit it off. I mean, we fought like cats and dogs too, like kids do, you know, but we had our own little gang around the neighborhood. One time we got actually where, I don't know how it worked out at the Church of God, it was the Church of God on 10th and Buffalo. Uh, in Tampa, Florida. We would do songs, just, and we actually got a girl that was playing piano, and she actually just kind of like would do the songs with us. So we had the piano, the drums, and uh, the pat with the guitar. We uh, practiced in the car on the way from her house to the church, just in case. The trio would then perform at any church that let them sing, even opening at one point for a group called Nancy Harmon and the Victory Voices, playing in front of about 350 people. I, I still have the music. Oh, yes. Yeah, she would hold a revival during the week of church. I mean, actually, you'd go every night, but she'd want to because that was so good. And they harmonized exceptionally. I mean, she, it was very spiritual. It felt good in your heart when you walked out of there. Once you start doing a song, and we found this out, because you could add to it, Hallelujah, start out with Hallelujah and Harmonize, you could pretty much add God is so good, God is so great, you know, and, and do all that. And we did. We did. We did. I was very proud of that part. From there, Chris started to admire the family bands that would play at church. He took a special interest, however, in the snare and hi-hat, later on purchasing a blue snare drum from a family friend. 
we became really good friends. He drove me crazy when I was a kid because my bedroom window was where the pad was. And he would be drumming and I'm thinking, oh my God, you know. So he was always into his drums. He, he totally still loves them and it's amazing. He and Patrick would sit in his living room for days just jamming together with Patrick on guitar. And little did they know what the future would hold for them. Let me see, Chris Kidd, I met him in 1976 at Hillsborough High School early in the morning. We were standing there by the library and uh, we sparked a conversation and from there it uh, turned into a great friendship. In 1979, Chris and Patrick formed a band called Bootleg alongside bassist Joe Porter and guitarist Steve Gilbert. It was funny how Chris and I decided we wanted to start us a southern rock kind of band, you know, because we both enjoyed playing that. So he brought his drums over to my apartment and set them up in the back bedroom. And it was just him and I for a while, just a guitar and drums. And then we put an ad out for a bass player. And uh, this guy, Joe Porter, answered the ad. And he, the first time he came over, he was a pretty cool dude and everything. He had a car. He sounded really good, and we jammed, and Chris and I were excited, you know. But the next time he come, he showed up at my house real early. Come to finally have a car or anything, and he was coming from St. Petersburg to USF area where I live. And he uh, hitchhiked with his bass all the way there. But we liked him so much, we just, we let that slide, you know. And uh, he showed up to every gig, and every rehearsal. And then next thing you know, somebody knew somebody who played guitar, and then this guy, Steve Gilbert, who was an excellent guitarist, he came in and we started really get serious and started playing some gigs. They would use any places a venue, often setting up in Chris's parents' backyard. One popular place was outside the pad, which was a tool shed built by his father that was later converted into a jam room. The pad, the notorious pad. Uh, we would have to sit here for probably hours to uh, speak of the pad stories, but well, we once said about, uh, Chris Kidd probably correct me on this count, but I think we had somewhere around 25 to 30 people in the pad at one time. And of course this thing was like an 8 by 8 uh, structure. And um, yeah, we had a, uh, that was one of the times that we would have uh, our little parties in there. Around this time, Chris would start to play at local bars and get more acquainted with other bands in the area, one of which was Quick Trigger, a southern rock band featuring guitarist J.C. Vitt. Well, uh, I think Chris used to come see us um, playing when we were in Quick Trigger at, you know, the various bars we were playing at, MBs and the Bottle Club and all those places. So I think that that's how I met him initially, but he was also playing in a little pickup band with our bass player, so I, that's how I actually got to know him personally and got introduced to him. Bootleg would play such venues as the Sandpiper in Clearwater and the Spotted Stag in Tampa, playing the local circuit for the next year, establishing a name for themselves. And that's how Bootleg got started. Following Bootleg in 1980, Chris would go on to play with a guy named Kenny Brewster in the Black Diamond Band. In the 1980s, the music was good. Most of the bands were good. Um, you had uh, the Outlaws, and you had, uh, oh gosh, so many bands I could not even remember them all. The 80s, well, it was definitely rock and roll. We were um, always going around to all the nightclubs that would uh, have the um, good local rock bands, not necessarily locals, but that would come in and um, we would just more or less look around and see who was playing where. But it was easy to get a gig back then because they didn't pay anything. So a band would set up and go play at a pub or something. All you got was the door if you were 
brave enough to collect most of the biker bar we played at. <laughs> Manuel, our friend Manuel, he would collect the money at the door and the big bikers come through. I ain't paying to get in. Okay, that's good. That's cool. <laughs> I, I drove a 72 Ford L2D with four doors. We take out the back seat out and load all his drums and equipment in there. And that was, I can't, ima I can't remember how many times we did that throughout the years. And we, we played for the pot, you know, a lot of times we get like $10 a piece. And, uh, but in the 80s though, there were so many good bands around. They didn't have to pay a lot of money. If you wanted to play, you you had to play for what you got. It was a it was a good time because the music was good. Then. You had the southern rock, which what we we did a lot of. We did some Beatles and we did some uh, Aerosmith. And, uh, we mixed it up pretty good. We had a good time. They played around a little bit. They were getting little gigs here and there most notably at Joyland, a venue with a rotating stage. Eventually, the guitarist, Doug Brewer, who went by the name Craven Moorhead on stage, left the band, and Patrick was brought in to take his place. Chris played with Kenny Brewster and Black Diamond uh, probably for a year or so, and they had a guitar player at that time called Doug Brewer, and he was a really good guitarist. And, uh, he had fallen out with Kenny, and, uh, Kenny needed a guitar player quickly, and I wasn't doing anything at the time. I was doing a single, and uh, Chris called me. He says, hey, man, you want to play some country music, you know? And I said, yeah, I'll give it a shot. So next thing you know, I rehearsed with them, and Kenny thought I fit in, and that's how I got in with the Kenny Brewster Black Diamond band. The group would often perform a few songs without Kenny, usually bringing him out later on in the gig, promoting him as a big deal at the time. From 1981 to 1982, Chris would join up with Frank and Annette Enley in a band called Night Fox, with Hilary Kaufman on lead vocals. Um, we got off the road with a top 40 band. We were playing Five Nighters on the road, touring the southeast. Uh, Tennessee, Georgia, uh, South Florida, we were playing everywhere. Uh, things didn't work out too well with that band. We decided to leave and come back to Tampa and form a band. We ran an ad in the paper for a drummer and a lead singer. and. Chris was the first one to show up. We met at, uh, I mean, from from the band, we both answered an ad. And so we met as, I don't, I don't really remember if we um, were there at the same time trying to get the job or if they did us one at a time. I have no idea. He set up his kit, sat down, you know, played the songs we agreed to audition on. I didn't have to look any further, that was it. Didn't need to audition after that. We, uh, we hired him on the spot, we walked in, super confident um he had that personality like i've known him forever we knew him forever yeah. super comfortable in his own skin you know this would serve as a departure from southern rock and lead into a wider range of songs we were 
mainstream rock. We were mainstream, we were not southern rock, but we had seen him in bootleg. That was the band he was in at the time, and they were super tight, but they were southern rock. And it was kind of the same thing we told Hillary. We said, you know, we're not, you know, we're, we're mainstream. We're gonna play a, a wide selection of mainstream rock. At that time too, we were, MTV was, you know, coming out at the, at the, at the end of this band, and we started picking some songs from there that we were doing. Um, they didn't think I would be a good fit because um, I was more of a Stevie Nicks, Bonnie Raitt, Emmylou Harris kind of. In fact, I told her no, and she, I, I said no, this is not going to work out. And she said, she goes, give me a chance, man, I can sing rock. So I said, okay, we'll come back for a second audition and told her to learn Barracuda and Promises in the Dark, two of our bigger numbers. So he made me learn uh, some a couple of tough songs. Uh, Promises in the Dark and Barracuda. And uh, Chris probably uh, it, uh, didn't, you know, he probably played on those. And and then I passed that audition, so. And she knocked it out of the park and she was in. That's how the band formed. We went to Skipper's Smokehouse. Yeah, first and we said they had a, a Sunday jam. You could just write your name in if you got there early enough. And we wrote our name on the board at Skipper's and we played a set on Sunday and the owner, Dennis, from the Stag came out to see yeah. that Night Fox band and we got hired. That's yeah. how it started. The band would play together at different bars, especially the Spotted Stag, seen here with Hillary's name on the marquee. It was impressive to play the Eleven Arches, but the Stag was our home. Stag. That's where our Spotted following Stag came. Club, Ballard Avenue. Yeah, we, hmm. you know, we right started... Right by the mall. Yeah, right by the mall, a lot of college kids, and we started drawing a crowd there, so yeah. we, it started to build. It was rocking, high energy, people dancing, yep, a lot of movement. It was it was a fun time, it really was. And he had that passion and that drive. Mm -hmm. Man, yeah. when he played, you can hear it in his playing. You know, listen to Hard in My Heart. You know, he must have listened to the demo, and we, I have two versions. And on the one version, he just played straight Tom fills, and they're beautiful. He must have listened back to the demo, because we have version two, and he did these really killer flams on the toms the stick action, the flam, you know, all the way down, and, I, and it just jumps out at you. And Chris was just sitting back there, all happy, energetic, spot on. One thing I like about him, it wasn't just playing the song, it was putting the right flair there and playing it right. You know, that's the Hollywood side of Chris. And he right? has a lot of charisma. That brings Charisma, yeah. Charisma. He There's has, the word, but it's not just as a person. Just the way he would be, yeah. not, in a, not in a boastful way. Right. Or, he was humble, yeah. but he would just—he just naturally had that. Look. He had charisma in his personality, Natural. but also in his playing. And he didn't yeah. have to put it on. He just came in, and yeah. there he was. He was the most happy when we were putting the logo on his drums. Um, we cut it out. We had to glue them, paste them on, and he wanted Chris Kit, and he wanted that white box yeah. on the side, you know, next to it. And he was so happy. Um, just having that, like, look at those drums, he says, Chris, that kid. Right? I just remember him. He was really happy. Eventually, though, Annette and Hillary parted ways with the band, leading to Chris and Frank to do another project for a short while called The Affair. First, it was an all-male version of Night Fox, and that was the one we came out and we played the Eleven Arches with. It was a lot of work. You know, there, were, there was work in the C Circuit Clubs, there was work in the B Circuit Clubs, and work in the A circuit clubs if you know had a good enough band. So it was a, it was a hot scene back then. It really was. And that's how Nightbox started. A year later, in 1983, Patrick would be involved in Longshot, a band he put together with bassist Charlie Billings and Charlie's friend, guitarist, Mark Weirich. I hurt my back pretty bad uh, during a move. I was moving with my first wife and I pulled my back out. Well, I ended up in the hospital. It was bad. I ruptured a disc. Well, in the middle of the night, well, not even the middle of the night, it's probably 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock in the morning, I hear this guy yelling out in the hallway and cursing crazily. And uh, there was no one else in my room but me 
and I'm going, hope they're not bringing this guy into my room. And sure enough, the door opens and here comes this guy. Redhead, goatee, cursing. Finally, they knocked him out. But that evening, the nurse came in right around dinner time, and she opened the curtains, and we looked at each other, and I had my guitar under my bed. And he looked down like that, and he looked at me, and he says, well, damn, at least they did something right to put me in a room with a picker. <laughs> so, next thing you know, we were having parties in the, in the hospital room with his friends and guitars playing, and they'd bring beer in and hide it. And uh, they finally kicked us all, kicked them all out, you know. But that's how Charlie and I got together, and uh, next thing you know, I'm playing with Charlie and Mark Wyrick and this guy named Jay Mutton, who was a drummer, and we became uh, Long Shot. And Jay Mutton moved. After the departure of their drummer, Chris got the call. So I automatically thought of Chris. I'm like, hey brother, you wanna play? Next thing you know, Long Shot developed with me and Chris and Charlie Billings and Mark Wyrick. We played all the little pubs and stuff, USF, we did some big shows at USF, and that's, that's, how, uh, that's how I met Charlie and that's where our story began. The band would go on to play bigger venues than Chris was used to, including the London Victory Club. Between Chris playing again with Patrick and Patrick bringing in Charlie Billings, the trio would form a bond for last a lifetime. For a brief time after Longshot, Chris joined back up with Joe Porter in a band called Native Tongue, featuring other bandmates Patrick Plastic and Kim Phoenix. After playing together for a while, the band got the opportunity to play with a future country music star. At one point, they jammed with a band called Cottonmouth, featuring none other than Trace Adkins. Adkins liked their sound, and even ended up having Kim sing with him on a song he was working on at the time. However, this led to Chris joining another band, aimed at a heavier sound, more in tune with the time era. In 1984, Chris would go on to play with friend Billy Nixon in Assault, along with Rafael Siaka, aka Taz, on bass, and Randy Kelly on lead vocals. Well, we met, uh, I believe it was um, 1980, the late part of 1983. I was playing in a band called Nothing Fancy, and uh, we split up. And uh, in between time, uh, there was another local band called the King Mac Band, and uh, they were uh, added a guitar player to the band, so they called me. And uh, so we got that band together where we needed a drummer. So back in those days, we didn't have YouTube or anything like that, so any musician that was looking to get in a band, you would um, put an ad in a local music store, the laundromat, the flyer, you know, and all that. So we found Chris's number, we called him, and he, we, at that time we were rehearsing at my mother's house in the garage. And um, then Chris showed up, and that's how that became, you know. Him and I hit it off just really great, you know, right off the bat and everything. So what happened was, the person in that band got sick, so we ended up, you know, splitting up. So me and Chris, we just hit it off so well, we decided just to start a band ourselves, you know. And, um, and that's how Assault eventually came into play. Yeah. So we got Randy to sing, lead singer. And back then he had that cool uh, kind of Bob Seger look and everything it was like perfect. So we, everything was great. But at that time, Southern Rock was kind of just going on the back burner a little bit because you had Van Halen and all that kicking in with the more heavier rock. And Randy was still wanting to do country and southern rock kind of hang there. So we decided to go in a different direction. And that's how we got Paul, the lead singer, because he was a more of a rock type singer. And so he fed in perfect as well, you know. They were a force to be reckoned with. 
the band dominated the scene, playing all over the Bay Area, including back at the Sandpiper. There were so many clubs you could just go to, and there was a band at every club, and that was just the theme of Tampa Bay. I mean, we dominated it, and it was just, you know, me and Chris, oh God, we, <laughs> so many memories of just going out, and even outside of playing, just going out, checking out the other bands. The band would continue to play together for the next couple of years. Chris played for a few months in a band called Sedona, alongside a guy by the same name who we met shortly after Assault. They would go on to play several gigs and some private parties together before parting ways. Then, in 1986, Chris would join Nick Pages and Roland Costello to create The Blend. With Roland on guitar and Nick on bass and lead vocals, the trio was unstoppable at the time. I think I met, met him through uh, Angie. You know, wasn't Angie his sister? Yeah, so we went to school together. So I met him, and I think me and Roland were doing a two-piece band. It was me on drums and, and Roland on guitar. <laughs> And then uh, I think he mentioned to me, and then we got a bass player named uh, Jerry Law. So we were a trio for a while, but somebody, then he fell off, the trio guy. And I think Roland mentioned something about the Chris. And uh, next thing you know, I moved from drums to bass, and the blend was born. Black Mountain Stash was the name before we went to the blend. And, and, uh, we also had some jams in my garage beforehand and Marshall Roach who's passed he used to jump in on some of those jams and Monty Yoho of the uh, Outlaws used to come over sometimes yeah, so then the second jam came along and then next thing you know it was three and we started to think or right around there we started to think okay maybe we should try to find some gigs and we did find one at Squires you know in, in uh, South Tampa that's the first place we played, and we played there solidly every weekend for 
I want to say three to five years, I forgot how long, but we had great crowds there. It was, it was crazy. They played at venues like Squires and even recorded multiple songs, including some originals, at Morris Sound Studio. We had some epic songs there. We, we, we worked hard. Um, we rehearsed a lot. We practiced a lot. Really, really had a tight, tight trio then. We were just really tight. There was one time we practiced for like, I want to say that we went 12, 14 hours to practice one day. And, uh, we had rented or let somebody else use their clubhouse. I forgot it was somewhere off 30th Street. And we, uh, we rehearsed there. And that was when we became a band that day. And one day we said, wow. Yeah, we ought to stand here, the drummer of the blend. Yeah, I, I try to keep the, one of the, like a heartbeat going. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. How long have you been a drummer? Uh, approximately 14 years. We understand you're going to be doing a tour here in the near future. Oh, After that, Chris would spend some time filling in for Quick Trigger at various gigs and events around town, thanks to his friend JC. The band's actual drummer, Brooke Millington, would often swap with Chris depending on the gig. You know, we had played a few times before that together, and he had subbed for Brooke and whatnot, but that's when it was kind of like became second nature. I mean, literally, when you showed up on Friday night, you didn't know whether it was going to be Chris or Brooke playing. The band's other members, Louis Compola, Tommy Knight, who went by Lightning, and Rick Clay, also known as Munchkin, all loved playing with Chris after having known him since the late 70s, early 80s. Well, I met Chris uh, in, uh, in 89, January of 89, when I went to work for Gulf Coast Accessories. And uh, he was working on uh, the air conditioned side, doing ground effects, and I was working on the other side of the shop with uh, a friend, Henry Howard, that uh, basically was doing the uh, car stereos and phones and and other accessories. Basically, uh, Howard uh, Henry introduced me to Chris, and uh, I found out that, that uh, Chris played drums, and I played guitar. I said, man, we got to get together, you know, and, and uh, do, some, uh, do some jamming here. Been knowing, uh, been knowing Chris for 33 years. Chris's stint playing with Quick Trigger would continue into the early 90s. In the 90s, it was starting to calm down some. In the 80s, it was absolute mayhem. Uh, but uh, late 80s, early 90s, you know, that's when the Mothers Against Drunk Driving came into effect. And, and there was a big push for the bars to stop uh, having happy hours and all that stuff like that. So. Uh, it was starting to calm down, but there were still a lot of places to play, and you know, quite a few bands around them too. So. I was real close friends with with Lightning. Uh, we actually met at the Bowling Alley. Uh, JC used to work at the radiator shop right down the street from the vacuum shop, so I kind of knew them all, and I knew that they were in a band, but they were inactive. But in sometime in the early '90s, they were going to get the band back together. And I remember going to their first performance as the new reincarnated band, and it was at the harbor side right down here on the river. And man, they were really good. And then they started doing regular gigs, you know. And then shortly thereafter, you know, I was always a guitar player myself. Not great, but I was getting there. And Lightning helped me tremendously. You know, he showed me a lot of things. 
And uh, eventually they invited me to get up and play a song or two, which in turn developed into like, I was the, what I consider the fifth Beatle, you know? Whenever Brooke wasn't able to make it for his schedule, Chris was always the fill in. He was always on call. And, so I, kind of how I met him all. Still filling in here and there, they would play at Maestro's and even at JC's house. Everybody loved, everybody that I've ever mentioned that name to, and I remember seeing David call and first meeting him years ago. And he was asking me, we were just meeting each other, asking about stuff, and I told him I used to play with the, the guys in Quick Trigger. And uh, when I mentioned Chris Kidd, David call goes, wow, you know Chris? And I go, know him. He goes, man, I love that guy, man. Tell him I said hi, I love that guy. I haven't seen him in so long. Apparently they played together at one point, you know, before I knew either one of them. And he was always a pleasure. He really taught me a lot of things. As a drummer, he taught me that eye contact was one of the most important things between band members. Everybody knows how the song goes and all that. Everybody knows the words, but you don't always know when, it's, when you're going to stop. You know, so he taught me that eye contact and a, just a simple, everybody knows mm -hmm. that, that that's it. But he made it easy to play. If you listen to him, you were always right on as a rhythm guitar player. In 1991, the Blinn would have a reunion, playing at a bar called Frenchie's. With Chris and Nick getting back together, it led to Chris sitting in occasionally with Crystal Blue, a band Nick had at the time during the 90s. Well, you know, he, I'm not sure how long Chris played with us. I think he was, he may have been the original drummer. I don't remember. Um, something happened along the way where, I forget, I'm trying to forget who we, we replaced. I, I don't know. I do remember the band Quadra Blue. Okay, this was a spin-off of Crystal Blue. And that was Chris on drums, Andy on keyboards, me on guitar, and Marshall Roach also on guitar. I met him a long, long time ago. Don't even remember what year it is. I'm sure it was in the 90s. Maybe, no, late 80s, I believe. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we had, we met at a party from a mutual friend. And I was already there. He came through the door with an entourage and laughing and choking and and I saw him I go well, that guy that's who, that's who I want to hang out with and then we started playing jamming and doing some music and we had a great time and you know from day one you know I was on team Chris we had crystal blue yeah. in 1991 with me and my nephew then it became me and Andy then it went to Marshall who passed away and Chris knew Marshall uh, and then all the way through to, to now. So, and then now Crystal Blue's back together as a duo again. It's like we've come right back to the same <laughs> where we left off. And I met a lot of, uh, I met Chris and a lot of other people too as well, but Chris stood out. Chris has got the mojo, man. He's got the passion. You know, he's, he's always hyped. Every time he was on stage, he had that look of confidence and he, he knew what he was doing up there. 
he was one of the, he was a busier drummer, but he got away with it. A lot of drummers don't get away with it, but Chris did. He knew what more was more. One of the first trios out there that sounded like a five-piece band. I don't know how we did that, but the ZZ Top stuff, we sound like ZZ Top. You know, so that, I think that's what separated us. You know, and I think that's what we also had a little, a little bit of, um, you know, anxiety about bringing anybody else and we didn't want to mess up that culture. We were brothers. We fought, you know, we, we did everything together. And um, so it's hard to pinpoint one thing. All, all I know is that when we took the stage, there's an item that's experienced anything like it since. First time we met was um, when Chris had moved in next door over on East 97th Avenue. And um, we did the, hi, I'm Brindley, uh, hi, I'm Chris. Where are you guys moving from? Oh, out in Wesley Chapel. And we're like, oh yeah, us two. Whereabouts? Um, uh, Some place up 577 called uh, Eloian Drive. And we're like, yeah, us. Us too. And I said, what what number were you? And he said, 34. And I said, oh my gosh. I said, we were 42 A and B. And uh, I said, you guys were pregnant and walking around the circle at the same time that we were pregnant. And he said, yeah, that would be about right. I said, so how old's your kid? And he said, um, Two, and I said uh, ours was born June 21st. So I said they're two weeks apart or 10 days or whatever. And he said, "Wow, that's crazy." And, um, and that was how we met. After the Blinn reunion, Chris stepped away from the drum set for a while to start a DJ business called Chris Kid Productions, or as it would later be called, CK Productions. Armed with a vast assortment of songs from all genres and time periods, and an amazing light show that he practically built from scratch. Chris gained a lot of business rather quickly. With the help of his longtime friend, Manuel Calvo, the duo would DJ at weddings and parties and all kind of different events over the next few years. Around this time, Patrick Foy was busy with a project of his own called the Caribbean Cowboys, a Jimmy Buffett style band he formed alongside Charlie Billings and conga player Miami McKinnon. Well, before the Conk Critters was the Caribbean Cowboys. It was actually me and uh, Miami McKinnon, who is really close to us, to he played the conga drum. So Charlie was playing with a country band, and me and Miami was doing the duo. Well, next thing you know, Charlie quits the country band. So I said, hey, Charlie, you want to come play with us? You know, next thing you know, we became the Caribbean Cowboys of the three-piece. We were playing Harbor Island. We started doing a lot of Buffett because people seemed to like it. So I started learning all the Buffett I could learn. And uh, we'd take that Buffett music and mix it in with some of the 70s rock and roll and, and Southern rock. And it just went over well. So. We became the Caribbean Cowboys and we played till uh, we had a falling out of some sort and we split up and then uh, I continued just being the Caribbean Cowboy. <laughs> so I, I continued to play uh, as a single act and then uh, as time went on 
Charlie and I got back together again. We don't want to be the Caribbean Cowboys anymore because this other guy had taken the name. So I said, let's be the Conk Critters. And we were, we were laughing, oh yeah, Conk Critters, what's that? The next thing you know, we all agreed that that's the name of the band, so we became the Conk Critters. <laughs> Eventually, Chris would pick up the drumsticks again to reunite with his brothers Patrick and Charlie. The band would play all kind of parrot head parties and venues for the remainder of the 90s. In 2001, Chris joined a band with my mother, Dewey Ellis, which was formed by an old friend of hers named Rennie Labrie. The original name of the band was the Cotton Pickers, but was later changed to the Rennie Labrie Group for obvious reasons. While Rennie served as lead guitarist, a friend of Rennie's, David Lee White, played bass, with Dewey and Rennie alternating the lead vocals depending on the song. The group would rise to popularity playing at a local bar called Dave's Lounge. He was a pretty talented guy, he, you know, he uh, would write up some good songs and stuff like that. And of course they, they used the uh, back room here at my house as a little studio, more or less, to practice all the time. This would lead to them recording an album with multiple songs at Moore Sound Studio, where Chris had recorded with The Blend years earlier. One song in particular was Stage Light Lover, a ballad that Dewey had written over 30 years prior with the help of Chris and Billy Nixon. I remember, I could be wrong, um, her and Chris came over to my house, she had the idea, the words, and I sat on the couch and came up with the rhythm just to go with what she was singing. It seemed like I remember something like that. Then I, you know, played some lead guitar over something I remember, remember something, I can't remember exactly, but Kind of, kind of that way. They became more popular on the Tampa charts, and before long, the song would even spawn a music video. The video could have been a little better at quality, but uh, it was pretty interesting. He was trying to take it up a level there, and you know, but it didn't go far. Soon after, Chris departed from the band. In 2006, Chris had taken a break from the local music scene yet again for a few years and was asked to play drums in a church introduced to him by his longtime friend, Brindley Shambaugh. The drummer that we had over at Crosspoint um, moved, I think. I asked him, would you consider coming and playing at the church? And he said, yeah, I, I think I would like that. So he came over, met Harv, and uh, they hit it off. and played for like a year and a half to two years over there at the church. The song that featured him on the drums at the church, and um, it, it has a drum solo part in it, and of course he loves to shine. <laughs> It wasn't quite how it was all those years ago with Patrick Foy and the Kid Brothers, but Chris was happy to play in the praise band, picking up the sticks yet again. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Y'all clap your hands now, come on. Let's see some dances on the dance floor. Soon after playing at church, Chris got back together with Patrick Foy to rejoin the Conqueror's, 
who had now moved from the Jimmy Buffett style to Southern Rock, a style they were all very familiar with. The original Conk Cruder band did a lot of Buffety kind of music. And we were just getting tired of doing it. And we played for the Pearheads a lot. And we were making some money and I started, a, I started writing. I started thinking, you know what? I need to get away from the Buffett sound and, and do my own sound. But I was a rock and roller. Blues, I like blues and rock and roll. And, um, Next thing you know, we just started playing rock and roll and uh, some southern rock and some original music and uh, the Critters became a party band. I mean, I remember nights, I don't even know how I got home, you know, <laughs> probably all of us at one time. Charlie Billings played bass while Chris's friend, Andy Singleton, was brought in to play piano, adding a whole new flavor to their sound. You know, I'd know, already met Chris and then when we moved to Zephyr Hills, um, they said, hey, I'm playing in this band uh, out at Rock Scallions, you, you know, come out and see me. So me and my wife went out there and had dinner, and uh, I looked over and I said, you know what, I could play with these guys. It was, that would be fun. And it was, uh, I don't know if it was Pat, but I think I ended up, Pat was having surgery on his shoulder, and I ended up playing with JC, I think, uh, in the beginning there. But then I played with Pat and we had a, a great time. It was, you know, it was, it was, they were fun guys. For the next six to seven years, the Critters would gain notoriety all over town, especially in the Land of Lakes and Wesley Chapel areas. They would play regularly at ukuleles and some other venues, where their fans would follow them to every single gig. You have fun, and we're having fun, and they see that, they're having fun. Every gig that we ever did together was a good gig, even when the gig wasn't good. We'd always talk about it later. Man, I'm sorry I did that. Oh, I'm sorry I did that. We always, you know, every gig was a good gig. Oh, you drinking beer, playing music with your friends, having a few laughs, seeing what's what? There's nothing better than that. But nevertheless, it's always been fun. Because it's not fun, like Charlie used to say, you know. Doing it. But honestly, it was a pirate theme bar called Rap Scallions where I truly believe their following grew to epic proportions. We were the Beatles of Land of Lakes. He can play everything. And over the years, I've seen pictures of him with the double bass pedals and uh, the, the big hair era and all the rest of it. But, um, you know, my best memories, of course, are when uh, we were doing raps on a regular basis and that was kind of the home bar and uh, a lot of fun, a lot of fun with the nights of raps for sure. Jessica, the first time she ever heard him play was at raps and they did the ending to um, Led Zeppelin and he was like spot on and Jessica was just amazed at like Oh my gosh, he nailed that to perfection. So I'm like, oh yeah, he does that all the time.
while after, Chris, Charlie, and Andy would join JC Vitt to form Catch of the Day, which was a variation of the Critters with JC instead of Patrick. Uh, they have, were playing out there with Patrick, I think, and Patrick had something else going on or was sick or something, so I just kind of stepped in, and that was, I mean, it was just a, you know, a chance to play. I wouldn't do anything at the time, so it was a, like, I mean, they didn't have to drag me in there. I was pretty eager. They would often play at a bar called the Neon Cowboy, where the Critters crowd followed. Like I say, it was kind of a brotherhood thing, you know, it was just when he had to step aside, just like when Brooke had to step aside and, and Chris came with Crip Trigger, you know, all, every, same kind of thing, really. And, and when you find somebody like that, that you can just slot in and not have to worry about them, you know, you don't have to teach them the songs, you don't have to go rehearse for two or three hours to refresh their memory, but Chris was playing a lot, you know, and more than me at, at times, you know, so it was... I don't know, we just all really meshed well together. You know, we made that band, I mean, we just picked the name. Mm -hmm. We subbed for, I subbed for Patrick at Neon Cowboy. And at the beginning of the gig, or at the end of the gig, the owner said, well, what's the name of the band now? Since Patrick's not in it. So we just, I think it was on a sign someplace, Catch of the Day, so that's what we used, you know. So. Occasionally, Friends of the band, Fritz and Gary Carver, would sit in with Fritz on bass and Gary on vocals. The first musician I met after I moved to Florida from Ohio in 1976 was Fritz. Red Red Music, which is now Sam Ash, which is no longer where it used to be. It used to be on Nebraska Avenue, a little tiny little convenience store type thing. And uh, Fritz was waiting at the counter to check out, and I had walked in and was buying strings or something and we just started chatting and he was running sound on the beach out of Courtney Campbell Causeway for something and invited us out there being my wife at the time so ended up, so that's how I met him that's when I met the Quick Trigger guys and all that stuff and then I joined Quick Trigger and it just became a big circle of things you know we just kind of kept falling back together almost you know Following that, they would play at a venue called Ron Fest, a backyard barbecue with live music that brought together great food and great musicians to get together and jam. The event was named after Ron Nichols, a longtime friend of the band who sometimes sat in and played harmonica. In addition to Ron, JC's friend Deb Bowen would often sit in during certain gigs to sing. It used to be so easy. For a short time after Catch of the Day, Chris would sit in with a band called Dixie Funk, formed by old friend and longshot bandmate Mark Weirich. They would play a couple gigs before parting ways. In the past few years, Chris has been occasionally sitting in with Patrick Foy doing a duo at various venues. There is, however, talk of forming a group with Patrick and Nick Pages as a trio in the next year or so. Chris's legacy is that he's always been a good man and he's always loved the Lord. He, and he holds no, no bones about it. He makes it well known, and by his actions too, that he loves the Lord. And, and that's one of the things that really, one of the reasons that him and I got so close is, is our faith. You know, we have so much similarity in the way he treats his wife, Sabrina. He's cared for her and he's just a good, all around good guy, you know. I can't think of a kinder person, honestly. Spiritual? Uh, grounded? Kind to others? Do anything for you? You could rely on him. He, uh, a lot of drummers keep like putting their drums in the 
pawn shop or something and and then they can't gig or something but he was very responsible and he um <laughs> he learned the songs and he didn't get all wasted and messy and you know the fact that he's able to chris has always been able to come in and just sit down behind the drum and play but it's not that it's the fact that he could quick trigger was a band that did a lot of accents and we did a lot of punches and stuff like that, like, you know, stops, and and he just was a natural for that. He could always grab that stuff. He was a he was a good dude, and he'd bend over backwards to to, to help out a, a a fellow man, and especially a, a fellow musician. So, and he was one hell of a drummer. So. Consummate rock star, you know. That's. That's who he's always been. He was cool and he was uh, direct, down to earth. You know, if you have to pick musicians to play with in your band, you know, you want the ones without the drama, without the agenda. Right. And, and that attitude. was Chris. You know, and good attitude, always positive. Yeah. You know, even if something doesn't go right, you know, the people that so can just rally together on. and say, yeah, we'll get through this, we'll go to the next gig, whatever. Those are the people you want. So, and, and again, the passion and the flair he put into his playing and his stage presence. You know, and all that, uh, his perseverance, yeah. his great nature, yeah, still, uh, we, and being Chris the Kid. Music has always been in his life. I mean, the love for playing drums is one thing that he's always uh, you know, enjoyed doing. Chris is a survivor and a fighter, and he has a heart of gold. You know, uh, that's hard to do when you've been through what Chris Kid has been through. Looking back, Chris has always been a lovable person, and he cared about other people. I think he's always been a good, honest man. I mean, he's always tried. He's a little bit more like our dad than I am, but you know, it kind of goes with that. But I, I you know, I, I think he, I think in his heart, he does what he thinks is right. And. Um, no matter what he was going through, he would show love to other people. I would say a good family man, um, a great friend, you know. Well, you know, obviously he's you know, a great drummer. He's, you know, a great friend. He's, you know, got a great sense of humor and that's, that's what pulls me in any, to anyone. Hard worker, always hard, you know, always worked hard wherever he was at. Chris's legacy was to enjoy music, turn other people on to his music, show his love for other people, and to get along with other people. And when you think about how vast his friends are. His legacy was all about love and, and friendship and, and people, and he loves the Lord. There's different levels of being a musician. There's guys that can play, and they go out and play and make money and get by. And then there's guys that can play, but can actually improve, you know, and, and the band improves a little bit every time they play together. And that's the kind of musician that Chris is. His absolute politeness and, and his, you know, just his demeanor, his laid back, kind demeanor, you know, not just drummers, but musicians in general, a lot of times will get boisterous or I don't know if I should say ego, but maybe, but it was never that way with Chris. He was just always the kindest, you know, humble and just kind, you know. So when I go see a former bandmate, they're with another band, you know, hey man, good for you, you're still doing it, man. You're still rocking. And, and why? It from the soul. Why are you doing it? Because you love to play. Right. You know, you're not doing it for a record contract now. You're not fame doing it for any or... fame and fortune or stardom. Now you're doing it for the pure love of playing. And I knew that in 81 mm -hmm. about him, and I know that now in 2022. Yep. Yep. So, you know, and that's his legacy. He's just got a way of speaking his truth. He tells it like it is, whether you like it or not. And I love one of his favorite things that he does all the time, long story short. I hear that all the time. I, I always thought we should have a song. That just came to me right now. We should write a new song together, get rolling down here in the blend, and, and actually record a song. 
that is that title right there, you know. Long story short. But I think his biggest legacy is being a family man and a father. I mean, how can that not be the biggest thing in your life? Music is just always icing on the cake. And everybody likes cake. But, you know, the meat of it is, you know, being a family guy and, you know, just being a good guy. And funny. I'm real proud that, you know, he's in the situation that he's in. You know, I love him very much. And, uh... I'm glad we're close. That makes me feel good. As far as the music side of that, the people that got to jam with him will just, you know, know that, you know, he was uh, just a good drummer, you know, good all around Chris Kidd. <laughs> you know what I mean? He loves to play, he loves to be out there performing. He was happy. In, he was happy at rehearsals too. Always. You know, his legacy would be all the music that he's played. You know. To me, his legacy will go down as a believer in Jesus Christ and a lover of his brothers and sisters. He was so happy to be there. Yeah. Happy to be in the clubs playing. He was. He flat out told me, he goes, I'm not in this to get a record contract. You know, something happens, great, that's great. But I just love playing. Yeah, I love too. being in the clubs. Mm -hmm. I'm here for the scene. I'm here for, you know, he just loved the experience of being out and playing. And he was so happy when we were gigging. I remember this moment. It really, and this, this, this defines that. You know, you gotta picture this. You know, we're, we're on a break things swirling around us, you know, the club, the crowd is there, you know, our friends are there, everybody wants to talk to you, you know, the club owners, the waitresses, everything's going and everything's spinning, he just comes up to me and he goes, hey, come on, you want to go up and do a shot of Crown? <laughs> and it's not just about that, it, it, I'm like, it was yeah, sure, it was, hey, everything's swirling, everything's happening, it's real busy, we're playing, but let's go over to the bar and let's celebrate this moment. Yeah. When you're having a down day and you look back through this, you just think of the boss and a little Springsteen. <laughs> and that ought to make you smile. And, it, and that's what it was. We, the it's two of us walked up to the bar and, and you know we toasted to this band and this moment. Mm -hmm. And it was epic. Because Chris, he, he, he loved that. He savored that. But this moment, man, let's do a shot of crown. Yeah. That was Chris Kidd. That's Chris Kidd. A lot of people don't know, besides being a killer drummer, he's a killer. He's a great singer. Chris has got a great voice, you know. He's a special drummer and a very underrated singer. He sang a lot of stuff that was really up there high. Um, I think he sang Who's Right or Wrong or something like that. There was a few like that. And uh, so, you know, he's one of the best musicians I've ever played with. In closing, Chris Kidd's career in music spanned over 40 years. From his humble beginnings, singing in church with Mark and Patrick, to rising to local stardom playing such venues as the London Victory Club, to recording a music video at Morris Sound, Chris has truly done it all. He played with some of the best musicians ever to pick up an instrument or grace a stage. Not only that, but he formed bonds with so many friends and brothers over the years, bonds that will last a lifetime. His presence in the Tampa music scene definitely left a mark, and quite honestly, will be unparalleled for a long, long time. Whether it be classic rock, mainstream rock, southern rock, or even playing in a praise band, there's nothing he can't do. And to get off subject for a moment, he's done all of this while continuing to be a wonderful father to me. He's taught me so much over the years and gave me so many great memories. There are definitely times that I'll never forget. I'm blessed to be able to say that he's my dad. But back to what I was saying, there's no doubt that Chris Kidd is a legend. The stories that were told will go down in history as some of the most epic band stories in Tampa. Playing at popular dive bars, rocking in backyard barbecues, or just jamming with friends. Those are the times we'll always remember and always look back on. And in the end, looking back, they were good times. They were the best times. They were the life and times of Chris Kidd.
love you. You're a brother. And um, can't wait to uh, let's get together and jam. And peace. I love you, brother. Chris, uh, you're like a brother to me. Like I said, not a gay brother, but I love you. And uh, you're you're the reason I've played in bands around Pasco County, and and the reason I've had so much fun over the last 30 years that I've known you. Gotta make a stand, you never No, Chris Kidd, you're more than a friend, man. You're like a brother to me, always have been. I mean, uh, 40, I'm gonna say 40, but 46 years now. We met in 1976, so 46 years of friendship. Hey, Chris, love you, man. Keep on rocking. Hope to see you soon, slime old. Chris, I'm glad you're part of my life. I'm glad we're buddies. I'm glad we made so much music together. And I hope we get to again. I love you, brother. Hey buddy, I just want you to know that I love you like a brother and I hope you and Sabrina are doing well and I wish you the best Thanksgiving and a Merry Christmas and I hope to see you again soon, okay? All right, my brother. Well, Chris Kidd, I can tell you, we've had amazing years of doing music and reuniting here lately made me realize that we're not done. If you're not dead, you're not done. See you soon, brother. So, Chris, remember that band house? Remember that one time we were gonna be a road band, but then we turned out to not be a road band. The band house really sucked and they wouldn't put us in hotels, but we spent one night at this band house. So that is what I'd like to just put out there, that one night at the band house. I don't know if you remember or not. That's it. Hey brother, you know that the Lord put us together a long time ago, man. We're old men now. We started out as young kids. I feel like I am totally blessed to have you as my best friend and my brother. Uh, you have taught me a lot of things through the year that you don't know you taught me. And um, I just, I pray every day that we can continue to play music until we just can't move no more. <laughs> but I love you, brother. I love you a lot. Those times were the times of our lives. We didn't really know it at that time. Um, and my Nightbox days will always be really close. And um, once a bandmate, once you're a bandmate, you're a bandmate for life. And that's the truth. Miss seeing you and uh, greatest guy I know, right there. Yeah, buddy. You, you're the best. Frank and I would love you and our fond memories still to this day, whenever we talk about it, is always really fond. So keep on rocking, Chris. We love you. Just a great guy, man. But what you gonna do?
yeah. Let me sing one. I go to get the freight train down at the station line. I don't care where we go. I'm gonna climb a mountain, the highest mountain now. A jump off the Hey Dad, I hope you enjoyed the video, man. I made it just for you. You know, you're always telling me all these crazy stories from your years of playing music, and uh, we have all these pictures and all this video, and I thought it's time to put it all together, so I really hope you enjoyed it. And to everybody involved, thank you so much for your help. It's been a crazy month and a half, but you know what? We did it. Just driving around, sharing all these stories with everybody, it really meant a lot. It was really cool. And uh, hopefully, you know, we can spawn more things from this. I would like to say that I made a new YouTube channel, in addition to my own. It's called The Chronicles of Chris Kidd. And basically, everything from this video that I made, all the audio, you know, live performances, everything that he's ever done over the years, it's on there. And chances are, you're on there too. So, go on over to YouTube, The Chronicles of Chris Kidd, check it out. And please subscribe to the page uh, while you're there. And lastly, I just want to say, you know, just the response of how everybody was so involved in this. I didn't get any pushback. Everybody was so happy and, like, willing to help. It was surprising uh, that I want to do something in the following, you know, maybe a couple of months, maybe next summer. Kitapalooza, okay? Now, I want it to be like a Woodstock of sorts. I know you guys get together and jam, you know, but this is just like the jam of jams. Everybody's going to be there. I want everybody to bring their families. We'll do like barbecue. You have a stage and just whoever wants to play, play. There's no order to anything. Just no, you know, strict um, schedule. Just everybody's having a good time. And I want you to be there. So uh, I'll let you know about details for that probably around next summer. So, once again, guys, thank you so much for helping me with this project. And, Dad, I love you, man. You're one of a kind. And like I said, you are a legend. And I'm just thankful that you're my dad, and I can say that. So, all right. See you guys later.